Welcome, guys, to Elements Church tonight. Um, so, little precursor here. So, printing off my um, sermon this evening, apparently I printed over some other pages. So, like, I'm flipping through, and I'm like, oh, this is going good. And then I'm like, I have, like, three different things written on one page. So, so we're going to try and uh, work our way through. I think I was able to get it all reprinted off, and... By God's grace, we're going we're gonna to have a good time tonight, right? Amen. Excited you guys are with us. Um, we are approaching a very sacred time uh, in America, something that everybody loves and enjoys, and that's Valentine's Day, right? I mean, I'm getting ugly faces from, like, married people, and, and, uh, and so tonight, so I thought... As I was praying, right, and I'm like, you know, it's close to Valentine's Day, and so I thought what would be appropriate is to talk about love, right? Love is beautiful. Love is great. Love is something that we all love. And, and so tonight I entitled my message, Love and Distractions. Um, I think the two go hand in hand very well, especially uh, how we perceive love in America today. Now, like I said, this Wednesday, the 14th, is Valentine's Day. Or in our house, it's known as our oldest son, London's birthday, right? He was, he was born at 2.23, I think, Valentine's Day morning. And so for, like, Misty, I'm always, every year, I'm like, babe, I mean, I already got you the best gift you could get, like your firstborn son. And she doesn't, she doesn't really see it that way, so, I mean, that's on me, you know. But... I try. Every year, I try. And it's crazy because London is going to be turning 17 uh, on Wednesday, which makes me feel older than what I already feel. Um, and we won't be able to claim him on our taxes like next year, so that's sad as well. But, you know, is what it is. But in America, Valentine's Day is supposed to represent what love is in America, right? We... Uh, we look at it as this, this is what, what love is supposed to look like, what it's supposed to feel like, how we're supposed to respond to it. And according to the National Retail Federation, Americans spent $18.2 billion, with a B, folks, on Valentine's Day last year. 182 and that was down from the year before. It was like $19.7 billion on, on what? On like candy and flowers and cards. And I'm actually kind of fortunate because my wife is not, she's, she's not real big about cards. So I'm like, sweet, mark that off the list, right? She doesn't really like flowers. She likes wildflowers. We live at 9,000 feet. To find wildflowers, I'm going to have to dig through feet of snow, okay? So I'm like, that one's, I'm good there, okay, you know? And chocolate, I buy her chocolate, and then all, all I get from her is like, why are you buying me chocolate, huh? And I'm like, whoa, I'm just, I love you. I mean, you know, so it's craziness. They, they average it out to, they say that we spend about $140 per person on Valentine's Day every year. And the most common things that are bought are boxes of chocolates, right? Those average anywhere from like $15 to $30, depending on what you're getting. The second most purchased item is diamond earrings. I'm like, there's a big jump from boxes of chocolate to like diamond earrings, okay? You know, like the third one is a dozen roses. Okay, I get that, you know? Make, gentlemen, make sure they're red. Don't buy black roses for Valentine's Day. Whew, boy, that will not be a good one for you. Dinner for two was number four. But I'm like, I can understand if it goes like boxes of chocolate, roses to dinner, and, and, and then down the low and like, diamond earrings, but number two thing. This year for Valentine's Day, my wife and I, we actually, in contributing to the 18 plus billion dollars spent for Valentine's Day, we decided to build a room for our son. Because what's more romantic than construction, right? So we, we did it, and our son loves it, and my wife's super happy because our son's almost done complaining about when's my room going to get built. So there we are. And looking at this idea of love and how we perceive love as Americans, I, I was watching a TED Talk 
um, the other day, and uh, my inner nerd so came out. It was super awesome. Uh, but this lady, her name is, uh, let's see, her name is on this piece of paper. There it is. Mandy Lynn Catron. She's a, she's a writer, and she's an English teacher, and so she knows words, and she was talking about how we use the word love in America, and she said this. She said, so in love we fall. Talking about falling in love, right? For all you young people, I'm so in love. It says, so in love we fall, we're struck, we are crushed, we swoon, we burn with passion, Love makes us crazy, and it makes us sick. Our hearts ache, and then they break. So our metaphors equip the ex- or equate the experience of loving someone to extreme violence and illness. And I was like, okay, let's, that makes sense. You know, I mean, I, I, I can see that, you know, we're like, oh, I'm so in love, or I'm crazy. I mean, have you ever written, like, a Valentine's Day card that you're like so in love with you, I want to be violent. I mean, it doesn't happen, but we use these words. We, we talk about love in this way. And there's a lot of truth in what she has to say, but how we describe love often contradicts what love actually is. And I believe that for many of us here, if not all of us, we are, we are guilty of conceptualizing what love is. It starts at a young age, you know, as a teenager, and we, we have these fairy tale dreams of what love is going to look like or, or what it's going to look like for me personally. That it's something that, that we find or that we fall into or fall out of. Or it's something that happens to us that if we love something or someone, that we never let it go. Now, to me, I'm like, that could turn into a legal matter right there real quick, okay? You're like, I love this person. I'm never going to let you go. And then you end up in jail, right? Like, you can't do that. Or we look at it and we say that that love knows no bounds. This is another one. You might want to have a lawyer on speed dial, right? I mean, has no bounds. And you're that creeper outside the window. And you're like, I just love you, you know? (laughs) Knows no bounds. Or that love is blind. And if we're honest, love is blind. If we're honest, I think we've... We've all been caught off guard before when we were thinking, oh, love is blind, right? We didn't see that one coming. And so to understand love, I think we first need to answer the question, what is love? And to do that, we need to look at the one who designed love. And spoiler alert, I am not talking about Hallmark. They did not, thank God. So tonight I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. We you have your Bibles with you, we've got some in the back if you don't, or if you have one of those handy dandy fancy phones where you can download an app. We're going to be looking, starting off at Matthew 22. We're going to be starting in verse 35. And so where we find Jesus in this text here is Jesus has been hanging out with some religious leaders in the area. And they have been doing their best to try and trip God up or trip Jesus up on things that he's saying, right? They're trying to coerce him into saying something that isn't right or that he truly doesn't mean. And so in verse 35, it says that then one of them, an expert in the law of Moses, asked Jesus a question to test him. Now, the law of Moses, okay, there is like, or as it's called, the law, which is where they should insert, like, the law and order, dun-dun, right, you know? This guy who's the law, dun-dun, right? This guy understands what the law of Moses is, right? There's, like, 613 commandments that this guy has memorized. It's also known as the oral Torah because they've memorized it, right? I mean, it's spread word of mouth, and this guy doesn't, he's an expert, right? He doesn't just understand the complexities of of what is in the law of Moses, but he understands the do's and the don'ts, the ins and the outs of all of it. And this guy comes to Jesus in verse 36, and he says, Teacher, which command in the law is the most important? Jesus answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and most important command. And then the second is like the first. Love your neighbor 
the same as you love yourself. All of the law and the writings of the prophets take their meaning from these two commands. From these two commands. The first one he says is what? It's to love God first. Love God above and beyond anything else. And the second is to do this. It's to love your neighbor. And we've talked about this before because Jesus' disciples had some issues with this. They were like, Who's my neighbor? Is it that guy or the one down the street that turns his music up too loud? Or is it the guy sitting at the stoplight next to me from California that does not know how to drive in snow? I mean, we want to look at, well, who is our neighbor? But Jesus, he says, the two is, first, you have to love God. And second, you have to love people. You have to put them up there. You can't just say, oh, that's just so-and-so, and and I don't need to worry about them or focus on about them. But it says that everything that we do and say begins here. Love God and love others. First John verse four or chapter four verse eight says anyone who does not love does not know God. Let's just pause on that for a minute. Anyone who does not love what? Does not know God. That's big. Why is it? Why is it so important? Because God is love. So if we want to love someone, if I want to love my wife, or if I want to love my children, if I want to love my neighbor or co-workers or whatever, I have to remember that I have to love them. Why? Because God is love. And he didn't just design love, but he perfected it through Jesus. First John Chapter 3, verses 16 and 18. It says, and this is how we know what real love is. Jesus gave his life for us. So, that, so we should give our lives for each other as brothers and sisters. There's no distinction there. We talk a lot here at Elements Church about oikos, right? About extended family. That it's not just our biological family there's not just you know aunts and uncles and cousins and and everything like that but it's this extended family of believers and it says that we should love each other as brothers and sisters in verse 18 it says my children our love should not only be words and talk no our love must be real we must show our love by the things we do So now that we have looked at and we have answered the question of what is love, love is God, I think that we also then need to look at and answer the question, then how do we love? If true love starts with God, how do we exemplify that love to other people? How do we live that out here in Summit County with our neighbors and with people that are snowboarders just here hanging out. And speaking of snowboarders, how about that one person whose name I can't remember that goes to like high school here in Summit County, got the first gold in the Olympics for snowboarding? Yeah, props to that person. That's awesome. They have a name. I promise they do. I just, red, not, not blue, like you're ja- red. Okay. Red. I like it. Should have named one of my kids Red. Why didn't I do that? Like Red 1, Red 2, Red 3. It would have been easy. I mean, I'd have been golden. Oh, hey, I didn't even think about that. That was good. Golden, right? Anyway, so we've looked at what love is, right? And so how do we then exemplify that love? Well, first, I think it comes through sacrifice. We love through sacrifice. John 3, 16 and 17 says, Yes, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him would not be lost but have eternal life. God sent his son. And I love this. We, we look at John three sixteen like as one of the most popular, famous 
Bible verses there is, okay? It's like, it's like this one and then the one in Genesis where it says they were naked and not ashamed, right? I mean, it's like bounces back and forth between one and two, okay? But this one, we love it because we're like, this is so crucial, right, to what we believe in as Christians, that God gave his only son for us, but I would think that verse 17 is just as important because it says that God sent his son into the world. He did not send him to judge the world guilty, but to save the world through him. We love through sacrifice. God loved us through sacrifice. 1 John 5, 3 says, to love God means to keep his commands. And his commands don't weigh us down. To live out God's love, right? Right? We have to start thinking of other people. And I love how I love how John 3.16 and John 1 John 3.16 they both speak of the same truth. They both speak of a God who loved us so much, more than what we can understand with our, with our human minds, more than what we can comprehend, that he loved us so much that he was willing to sacrifice his only son so that you and I, who are fallible people, who are sinful by nature, that he said, I love you enough to offer up my son so that you can find freedom, so that you can have salvation, so that you can live a life that is not torn up and tormented by sin. And this is the love that God showed us, but it wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy choice. There's no way that it was an easy choice, but God understood the purpose behind it. He understood the need He understood the why. And so he was willing to sacrifice his son so that we could find freedom. Freedom from sin. Freedom from addiction. Freedom from destruction. And we can find freedom from the ugliest parts of our life because of love, which is the most beautiful part of life. C.S. Lewis said that the Christian does not think God loves us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. By God's love, our life, guys, friends, our life is transformed into something better than what we could have ever designed, something better than what we could have ever thought up. And if we, I mean, Let's be honest, let's look at the attempts that we have made on what love is, right? I mean, Valentine's Day is a perfect example. It's wrapped up in material things. It focuses on physical pleasures. It, it is, it's, it's, it's all about monetary things, right? Spending enough money, buying diamond earrings for somebody. That's, God bless them. But this is what we have come up as human beings, of what love is. It's our perspective on what love is or how to show love to other people. It's through gifts. It's through things that are not really that important. But this is how God defines love. He says, by giving everything for the greater good of others. By setting aside our selfish pride, by giving all so that others can know God. Not just saying, I'm going to go work hard for this person and help them put up a fence. Or, or I'm going to go, as Isaac has done a lot, I'm going to go help this preacher guy who doesn't really do a good job at hanging sheetrock. There's a special place for you in heaven, Isaac, I promise you that, man. Robert knows I'm talking about. He was there. But it's not just about these things. We've got to set these things aside because when we're giving to other people, the purpose behind it is so that they too can know God. So that they too can see that our life is changed or that it's different or that we don't follow the trends or the patterns of American society, that we stand against that. 
that we stand for something better, that we stand for love, that we stand for who God is, and we want to see others come to know that kind of love. So we love through sacrifice. The second thing tonight that I want to look at is that we can love through speaking truth. Ephesians 4, verse 15 says, We will speak the truth with love. We will grow to be like who? Like Christ in every way. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 in the message says, Concentrate on doing your best for God. Work you won't be ashamed of, laying out the truth plain and simple. Stay clear of pious talk that is only talk. Words are not mere words, you know. If they're not, I love this, if they're not backed by a godly life, they accumulate as poison in the soul. What we say when we talk to other people, the conversations that we have, the thoughts that we think about. Second Timothy tells us that when we're doing our best, it's when we're speaking truth. When we're doing our best for God, man, it's when we hold tight to that truth, right? William Shakespeare said that no legacy is so rich as honesty. No legacy is so rich as honesty. As I raise my, my two boys and my daughter, my wife and I, we want them to be honest. We want them to be truthful kids. And our oldest is not even a kid anymore, right? But I mean, we want them to understand the value in honesty, the value in truth. Malcolm X said, and I, I absolutely love this, he says, I'm for truth no matter who tells it. I'm for justice no matter who it's for or against. Honesty, speaking truth, is the foundation of exhibiting love to others. It doesn't show bias. There's no favoritism that is involved in it. And the reality is that when it comes to speaking truth, there's really two sides to that coin. One is speaking truth and the other is receiving that truth. Invitation and challenge found in both. And there are those, let's be honest, there are those who try to hurt other people by speaking the truth. They try to use it to, to, to cause shame in someone's life, or they try to use it to just degrade them, or to speak ill against them, or to be like, ha ha, I told you so, you really aren't that good of a person. And they try to use truth, and they try to use this honesty to hurt them. But friends, this is not what God's talking about when He's talking about speaking truth. To speak truth in love, we are concerned for that person. We're not, I'm trying to put you down, or I'm trying to show you up, but it's, I love you, and I'm concerned for you, and that's why we speak truth. The truth that is often said, can be hard to hear at times. I mean, let's be honest, it's not always Skittles and rainbows, right? But truth can cause emotional pain. To find out that a loved one has passed away or, or that something tragic has happened, it can bring this pain. The truth, truth can be the consequences of poor decisions that we've made that we have to answer for. It can illuminate a character flaw that we have might not seen. But even in those difficult situations, the beauty of truth is that it gives us opportunity to grow. It gives us opportunity to become more like who God created us to be. 
that he's not settled with or happy that we're just here when he wants us to be here, right? That God hasn't given up on us and said, I've tried for years and they're, they're just not going to get it. No, truth gives us the opportunity when we're receiving it to grow, to grow in our relationship with God, to bring us back to God if we have straight away. Truth is there to show us God's love. Now the other side of that coin is actually speaking truth into other people. When done with love, guys, we're telling other people that we care about them. Truth's not always, it's not always easy. In fact, there's a lot of times that it's really difficult to talk to family members or friends or even my children at times, to bring up things, to sit down and say, look, I need to, I need to speak to you about this. I need, to, I need to talk to you about the truth in this. It's not, always, it's not always easy, but we have a responsibility when it comes to that. And ultimately, again, it's that we want to see people grow. And that's why we have opportunities as believers to speak truth into other people to speak life into them so that we can see them begin to develop into the person that God ultimately wants them to be. And the truth is, we don't always know what that looks like. A lot of times we don't. We don't understand what it is that God is doing in their life or, or His long-term plan for them, but we do know that God's not content with people sitting idle. He's not content with people going in reverse back to where they have come from out of a a sinful life or out of an addiction that they have struggled with that God has brought them to, but God does not want to see them go back. And truth gives us the opportunity to see people grow, to challenge them in that. And we can speak truth to our friends, to our family, to strangers. We can do it through encouragement, right? Man, you did a great job at that. Rochelle, you and Kyle, you guys did an awesome job with worship tonight. Man, it was such a blessing to us, right? We can look at neighbors. Like my, my neighbor, like right next door, he's, a, he's a, a general contractor, okay? So as I talk about building this room, this, this guy could like bam, smack and have that thing up in a jiffy, right? And I'm the one that's like scratching my head about things, okay? But I mean, this guy, he, he decided to like redo, put new siding on the side of his house and I'm the one standing on my back porch with a coffee cup in my hand. I'm like, well, that just looks fantastic. Good job, Nate. You're, you're awesome. Don't fall off the ladder, you know? But I mean, we can encourage people. We can love on people when we see that they're down, when we see that they're just not how they normally are. You know, they're, they're, they're upbeat, they're, 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 you know, chippy about things, and they come in and they're just kind of like, ah, oh, things are just okay, you know. We can take those opportunities to speak truth into their lives. Truth about who they are, about God, who God has created them to be, that they are loved, that they matter, that there's purpose in what they do in their life, that, that somebody cares about them, that they're not a failure, We can use those opportunities to show love, to give love to others by what we have to say. Regardless of how or where or with whom we are speaking this truth. By doing it, friends, we are honoring God and we are honoring that person. That is love. That is what God showed us. That is what God hopes to see, wants to see within the church, within the community that we live in. Us exemplifying love. John John 14, as I close here, John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus says that I am the path, the truth, and the energy of life, no one comes to the Father except through me. And if we want to live out love, friends, if we want to live this out, we've got to understand that it's 
done through our words. It's done through our actions. It's done through us sacrificing for other people. This is the example that God has given to us. Friends, I pray that it's the example that we look inside and that we think and we say, you know what, where am I at in this stuff? Because let's be honest, we have days, right, where we get done with work and we're done with people. You know, we're like, I've had enough of these jokers, okay? We don't have to raise hands, but thank you for contributing. I mean, I do appreciate that. But we have days where we feel like we're at the end of of it all and we just can't do this anymore. But God says, even in spite of that, even in those moments, we can still show love. Not, Not the kind of love that our world has concocted, but what true love really is, the example that God has given to us. I'd ask if everybody could just bow their heads. I want to take a few minutes to to reflect on what God has shared with us tonight. And we we look at in this, we look at three questions. The first one is this. It's like, how is God speaking to me? How does he do that? What are the things through this message? What what was it that grabbed my attention? The second question is, what is God saying? Not just how is he getting my attention, but what is he actually saying? And the third is this. What am I going to do about it? You see, we have a responsibility as believers, as human beings. We have a responsibility when God is speaking and sharing that we look internally and we say, okay, how does this apply to me? Where does this, where does this touch my heart? What is an area that, that God's really pulling at that I'm like, man, that hurts or I don't even want to look at that. But friends, God is challenging us. And, and when we take these moments to reflect, these are our opportunities. This is our opportunity to respond to what God is saying. What is God saying to you? How are you going to respond to that? Heavenly Father, we we are humbled by your love. That you are a God who loves us so much you went to extremes for us. And God, I pray tonight as, as you have refreshed our minds on what love is and, and how we can live that out, God, I pray that it would seep into the very being of who we are. That later tonight is, as we're at Ruby Tuesdays or or tomorrow as we're at work or maybe it's a day off, but as we encounter people that, that we would begin to see them through your eyes, that we would begin to see people and love people how you love us, how you love people. And God, I pray, I pray that we would, God, that we would start to make that change, to make a shift. If there's one that needs to be made, if there's something that you're bringing to mind in this moment, that we would commit to following you in this. God, that you would be the voice in our ear, that you would be the one who is speaking and encouraging us, says, you can do this. You can grow here. I know that it's not comfortable, but... It is possible, and there is a purpose behind it, and God, that we would commit to that. Lord, I thank you for, I thank you for everybody that is here, God. I thank you for their heart, for you, whether they're just beginning this, God, or whether they're contemplating it, Lord, that you would speak to them.